Studying the Earth's history is kind of like solving a mystery because no one was there to give us a first-hand account of what it was like, scientists have to use different clues. So in this presentation, we're gonna look at some of the clues that scientists use. The first clue they use is soil. Soil is a loose mixture of small rock fragments, organic material, water, and air that can support the growth of vegetation. What's key here to know in this verse is that good, healthy soil supports the growth of vegetation. That just means that things can grow in it. If things can't grow in soil, then we just call that dirt. It's really kind of useless. One of the most important parts of soil is something called humus. It looks like hummus, but it's not. You would not want to eat humus. Hummus, however, is quite good. Humus is dark organic material. And so just a reminder, that word organic means something that used to be living. So humus is soil that has remains in it of things that used to be living. Now, this is important because in that organic matter is lots of nutrients that plants need to grow. Scientists study soil by looking at something called a soil profile. Now, when you think of your own profile, it would be somebody looking at you from the side. So a soil profile is much the same way. It's a vertical section of soil that shows all the different layers of soil. And each one of those individual layers is called a horizon. So here is a picture of a soil profile. And each horizon or layer has different parts about it. So we're gonna label the different soil horizons and the importance or function of each layer. So at the top, we have horizon A. In this layer is what we call topsoil. It has lots of humus. It's very dark in color because it has dead leaves and branches that cover the surface. Horizon B is underneath that. Um, it's not as developed as horizon A. You'll notice it's lighter in color. And this is something, um, this is where something called leaching happens. And leaching is a process where water seeps down through the top layer, carrying nutrients with it. So for example, when it rains, rainwater gets soaked into the ground and it makes its way down through the different layers. Remember up here in horizon A, and even here, all, both of these are horizon A, this is where all the nutrients are. So as that water moves down, it carries nutrients with it down to layer B, which is where the plant roots are. And the final layer, horizon C, is all this kind of very light white color. This is the least developed. It has lots of rock in it and no humus. Another thing scientists look at when they're studying Earth's history is of course fossils. Fossils are the traces or remains of organisms that lived long ago, and they are most commonly preserved in sedimentary rock. Usually when you hear the word fossils, we immediately think of bones and we usually think of dinosaur bones, but there are lots of other things that can be fossils. Aside from rock, fossils can be found in lots of other soils as well. They can be found in amber, asphalt, they can be buried in rock, that's sedimentary rock, frozen, or petrified. So this is a picture of an insect caught in amber. Um, amber is also kind of like tree sap. This is a picture of asphalt. Well, um, one of the most common places you'll see this is out in California, the La Brea tar pits. Asphalt is kind of like a thick tar, and sometimes um, living things uh, get caught in this car, uh, tar and solidify. Here is what a fossil might look like buried in rock. This is a fossil um, frozen in ice. And then this is what uh, petrified fossils look like. Um, this looks to be a piece of wood that has been petrified. And basically what that means is all the soft parts decay away and minerals come in and fill in those empty spaces and harden and turn it into a rock. So if you've ever seen a piece of petrified wood, even though wood can be soft, um, a piece of petrified wood almost feels like a rock. It's very solid. 
Another type of fossil we don't usually think of is something called a trace fossil. A trace fossil is a fossilized structure that formed in sedimentary rock by animal activity or in soft sediment. So in this case, it's not going to be a bone of any kind. It basically means that the animal left a trace of itself behind. So here are some examples. Tracks or footprints. So we see footprints that have been left in the soft material and then the soft material hardened over time. And so that would be a type of fossil, a trace fossil. Um, another kind of track an animal might leave is if the animal had a long tail that dragged on the ground, sometimes it would leave marks. You could see the marks of the tail. Another type of trace fossil is burrows, where um, the pathways or the shelters that animals dug in the sediment. So um, any kind of animal that lives underground and they um, dig holes underground, those can harden as well and be a trace fossil. And then their dung, which is their poop or the waste that the animal leaves behind. Um, sometimes it is left undisturbed and it can harden over time and actually tell us a lot about the animal. Tell us what it ate, um, how it digested its food, and we can learn a lot by studying that. All these types of fossils are super, super important because they do two things. One is they can tell scientists about environmental changes over time. So we can learn um, the environment of the uh, place. Um, we can learn about how the environment has changed by discovering the fossils that were found there. And then secondly, they can tell us um, how life forms have changed over time, how species have evolved and changed throughout the course of history. When studying fossils, it's important that scientists know about the law of superposition. And what this means is that when you have layers of rock that are undisturbed, it means there hasn't been an earthquake or erosion hasn't happened, then if you have nice, neat layers of rock that are undisturbed, older rocks will be lower than younger rocks. Here's what that means. Layers of rock that are towards the bottom of the layers are older. They were put down first compared to ones near the surface that were put down last, which means they are younger. So for example, let's say you're a geologist and you are digging through these layers of rock here and you are down here, let's say in level three, and you see this seashell right here. Now, you may not know how old that seashell is, but you know, because of superposition, that this seashell is older than this footprint up here. And the reason you know that is because of where it's at. Because it's lower, it is older than anything above it. And that's what superposition means. Now, sometimes scientists get lucky and find what's called an index fossil. An index fossil is a fossil of an organism that existed for only a short period of time. And it wasn't found all over the world. It was only found in one layer of rock and it wasn't around for a long period of time. One of the most best examples of that is the trilobite. And so when a geologist finds an index fossil, it's very helpful for them because they can compare that to other fossils and it helps them identify the age of the fossil. When a geologist finds a fossil, they don't come labeled with what they are or how old they are. So that's the job of the geologist to figure out what it is and how old it is. So there's two different ages that they can use. And both of these are based on superposition. So relative and absolute age is a way that geologists can see how old the fossils are based on this law of superposition. So absolute age is when they find the exact age. It's in years, it's a number. But sometimes they don't know that and they rely on something called relative age, where this is the age compared to something else. So for example, absolute age, if, if you were to tell me your absolute age, you are 11 or 12, depending on how old you are. We know because we know when your birth date was, so we know how old you are. However, 
relative age is not going to have a number in it. You're going to compare yourself to something else. So let's take your grandpa, for example, if you have a grandpa. You may not know how old he is. You may not know his absolute age. But you know, because of just basic laws, that you are younger than your grandpa. So if somebody asks you what's your relative age, you could compare it to anything that you know the age of. So you are younger than your grandpa. You are younger than your teacher. You are older than a first grader. Um, so that's the difference between those two. Absolute age would have a number because you know the exact age. Relative age, you are comparing your age to something else. And so scientists do this with fossils. Now, sometimes rock layers aren't always kept in nice, neat rows. And so they create something called unconformities. Unconformities are gaps that are left in the rock layers when layers of rock are eroded away. So here's how unconformities form. So this picture here at the top, this would be like step one. This is what it originally looks like. You can see all the layers of rock are in nice, neat, even rows. That's rare that it stays that way. What usually happens is we've learned in our layer of plate tectonics is forces inside the earth can push up layers of rock. This would be, for example, like a convergent boundary. Let's say these plates here are pushing towards each other, forming a mountain, so it creates the layers to get pushed up. Well, when that happens, then erosion can come along. And what we see here is this layer here has a big gap in it, right? You see it doesn't come across the top. Here it continues over here. So this gap would be like an unconformity. It's missing. It was eroded away by wind or water or some other force. And so what happens is finally, here again we see that missing layer that should be right here, but it's not. It got eroded away. But through history and through time, more new layers of rock got laid on top of it. So if a geologist is digging through these layers, then he comes across this, this sort of missing layer right here, then he knows that's an unconformity. And so he's gonna have a harder time trying to figure out the age of the fossils in that layer of rock.